Thank you, Matthew. Um, it's lovely to be here after um, waiting, is it two years or so for this uh, um, to take place and to hear all um, other people's really interesting presentations. Um, can you, is, am I near enough to the mic? Yeah. Um, so my um, presentation's titled Researching a Taboo. And um, what I want to do is to, to open up discussion of some of the empirical methods that we can use for exploring um, lived experiences of shame. And I'm going to do that by reflecting on some of my own research. Um, I think it's worth noting that there are many other methods of research in shame besides the ones I've used in, in, in my own discipline, psychology, some of the quantitative psychology has developed ways of measuring aspects of emotional experience or, or measuring um, assumed dispositions such as shame proneness. Some people have done some really interesting work using observational and ethnographic methods. But what I want to particularly focus on is using methods that actually engage participants in talking from a first person or writing from a first person perspective um, and using personal accounts. And I want to talk a bit about some of the issues or some of the challenges that I faced in using that kind of approach and I'd be really interested to hear some of your experiences afterwards as well. Um, sorry it's not <laughs> it's not moving on. Um, I'm just pressing that one. Okay, so I think we're all here because we recognize that shame is a powerful dynamic within healthcare. It can derail interactions between healthcare providers um, and patients or clients. Um, it can play a significant role in some health difficulties, it can exacerbate people's difficulties, but at the same time, shame is often hidden. And I think it's interesting that 10, 15 years ago, we probably wouldn't have had um, a session like this. Um, and shame's not just hidden. I think in, in um, many cultures, particularly um, maybe Western cultures, it's almost a taboo to to speak openly about shame and to report feelings of, of, of shame. So even though we're hearing lots of really interesting research um, and researchers obviously can sometimes engage participants in talking about shame, I think there are a number of issues um, in doing that. Um, and I'd be very interested on some of, in some of your reflections afterwards as well on how we can do that in a way that's respectful, that doesn't shame people, um, that's, that's ethical and that opens up discussion rather than um, closing down discussion um, because um, interviews, for example, become flooded with shame. So I'm going to start off reviewing why I think um, this is something that's problematic to explore or can be challenging to explore with participants. Some of this will be familiar to a lot of you, but for those of you who are less familiar with the shame literature, I thought it might be a useful place to start. And then I'm going to consider what um, some of this means for researching shame and, I, and I'm going to do that by reflecting on research focused on how people manage and repair experiences of shame, particularly looking at that in a mental health context and some research on experiences of shame in relation to receiving um, support with breastfeeding. So the first point to make is that um, without getting too sidetracked by different definitions of shame, I think we probably all agree um, that that's a, a, a sort of reasonable statement about what the experiences of shame is. The pain of being someone we do not wish to be. Shame's painful. And it seems there's something about, um, I guess, 
being human, we find it very difficult, not impossible, but we find it difficult to reflect on being inadequate, being a bad self, being inferior, without that being accompanied by rather unpleasant affect. So shame remains hidden, not just because people wish to conceal shameful aspects of themselves from others, but also because we tend to turn away from our own shame. We find reflection on our own shame to be painful. And therefore, we often manage shame by a process of denial. It's as if, 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 if we don't think about shame, if we don't hear shame, see shame like the three wise monkeys, um, then we're not feeling shame. So, you know, thinking from that point of view, why would somebody choose to participate in research where they're asked to speak about their experiences of shame? We also know that shaming can be, uh, uh, can be quite fleeting. It can be something that's almost on the periphery of experience. And Helen Block Lewis and others have talked about the notion of bypass shame, that we can almost not experience our, our shame and experience a blankness or a paralysis um, it, it, it instead. And therefore that does raise questions about using retrospective reports of shaming experiences. They can tell us something, but there are obviously things that people are unable to report. And we also know that hiding is not just a consequence of shame, it's probably better understood as part of the experience of shame, the impulse to hide. We don't tend to feel that we want to open up to other people when we're feeling ashamed. Um, instead, we want to disappear. We tend to avoid high contact when we're feeling shame as well. Which brings us to thinking about the interpersonal aspects of shame. Um, and a lot of theorists have emphasized intersubjectivity when thinking about shame. And, and I think for me, a useful way to think about shame is that it's kind of an awareness of the self as if seeing yourself through the eyes of others, becoming aware of how you are positioned in the social world and how that position is seen by other people. And I think Paul Gilbert has, has captured this particularly well when he described it as an inner experience of self as an unattractive social agent. And Paul talk particularly emphasizes a sense of relative powerlessness, um, the sense of a threat to social status. Other people have focused particularly on feeling rejected, feeling isolated, not belonging with um, other people. So the reason I'm emphasizing that in that, that kind of position in the, in the um, social world is that sometimes rather than just simply hiding when we feel ashamed, one way in which we, we can manage shame is by pretending it's not there. We deal with shame as if it isn't happening. As Lazar said in, in one of the, I think, the, the kind of the first significant papers to look at shame in a healthcare context, it is shameful and humiliating to admit that one has been shamed and humiliated. And Thomas Sheff has pointed out that that maybe seems to be particularly the case in modern Western societies where there's a strong sense of individualism. We're not meant to care what other people think. We're meant to be resilient to that. And therefore, we... There, there is a taboo on, on acknowledging that one has experienced shame. And we all tend to collude in, in avoiding discussions of shame. Goffman has talked to, uh, 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 discussed at length how um, quite a lot of social interaction seems to be focused 
on avoiding embarrassment, on avoiding shame, saving face, and also enabling other people to, sa to save face, supporting other people's performance of shamelessness or of not being embarrassed. And that seems to be one of the ways in which we, we deal with shame within the social world. So from that point of view, we could think of um, a, an interview, a research interview about shame is actually asking um, both the participant and the, and the interviewer to breach a social norm by discussing shame. This isn't something that we generally um, relish discussing. And then if we think as well about the way sometimes people defend against shame, that can make any attempt to engage in discussion of shame even trickier. And I think Nathanson's compass of shame is really helpful here. Nathan outlined, Nathanson outlined um, four common shame responses. Um, and he, he, he looked at how we don't just withdraw or, or deny. Sometimes a way of dealing with shame is to attack other people, to turn the tables, to blame other people. It's not me that's at fault. It's something somebody else is doing. Um, and various researchers such as Thomas Sheff have, have, have looked at how sometimes this can be quite veiled and quite covert and you can end up in interactions where there is kind of unspoken veiled denigration of somebody and somebody else responding to that in turn by denigrating somebody else. So none of this is ideal for engaging people in discussion of shame. And also we've got a possible shame response as well, whereby people sometimes engage in attacking themselves, self-denigration, which again makes it quite difficult to have a nuanced and careful discussion of shame. Um, Kaufman and others have talked about how people can get into a spiral of self-denigration that's very difficult to get out of and means a kind of tunnel vision about the experience so that a more nuanced reflection is difficult. So, as we've already seen, not impossible to engage people in talking about shame. But it does need, it does mean that we need to think carefully about some of the methods that we're using. And there are some challenges. So what I want to do now is to just reflect on my experiences of using um, three particular methods, using anonymous questionnaires, using semi-structured interviews, and also instead, um, using secondary analysis of data that was collected without a particular focus on shame originally, but which was actually quite a useful way of um, understanding um, shaming experiences by closely using an, an emotions lens to understand um, women's accounts. So first of all, an anonymous qualitative um, questionnaire. I think it's, it's quite some years ago since I did this when I was doing my own PhD. And I think at the time, rather naively, I thought by asking people to write anonymously, privately, I could actually bypass some of these rather tricky interpersonal dynamics in, in, in trying to to ask people about their experiences of shame. So this questionnaire explored people's experiences of managing and repairing shame. And it was a study with 50 staff and students at a um, British university. It wasn't particularly focused on a healthcare context. I was asking about experiences of shame more generally. But 
Um, my interest in doing this and exploring how people managed and repaired shame arose because um, I began to notice in some of the mental health research that there was becoming a stronger and stronger emphasis on chronic shame, dispositional shame, and ongoing internalized shame as something that people carried with them. Um, and that seemed to be the way that shame was being explored almost exclusively within the clinical psychology literature. And I was just wondering whether that was actually distracting us from looking at how people might repair shame by thinking of it as some sort of um, characterological um, phenomenon. And I was also interested in how social context might shape the possibilities for managing and repairing shame and might enable resilience or make it quite difficult for people um, to repair shame. So what we did was use a um, one um, a questionnaire that was an open-ended qualitative questionnaire and asked for a written narrative they were asked to describe the most recent situation you can clearly recall where you felt particularly shamed in front of other people and then on the questionnaire, there were a number of follow up prompts where they were also asked to write about anything that happened afterwards, to write about how other people responded, whether there was anything they did that helped them to move through the experience, whether anything had changed since, and if so, what had enabled that change and anything that had made it difficult um, to move out of the experience of shame. We were also interested in probing what the experience had meant to them as well um, and what sense they made of any responses they um, um, had from other people. So it was actually quite useful doing a questionnaire in this way. There was it seemed to be some benefits from writing anonymously and people disclosed a wide range of experiences and some of those experiences I doubted, maybe I'm being uh, pessimistic here, but I doubted whether people would have sat down in a, say an interview situation and actually discuss those. People talked about, wrote about things they'd never told anybody else. For example, having stolen um, from their mother or um, having been manipulated into unwanted sexual activities um, and made it clear on the questionnaire that this was something they kept to themselves ever since. So another advantage was that by using a questionnaire we got a reasonable size sample and we could look across a variety of different experiences and one, one of the things that stood out despite seeing many differences was the way in which for most people something needed to change about their, their position in the world and the way they re related to other people and validation from other people and the ability to connect with someone somewhere who accepted them in spite of this shameful incident was really important for most of those who'd actually who actually felt that they've reached some point of of, of being able to repair their shame. What was also, I think, particularly useful about having asked people to write quietly on their own where there was an opportunity for personal reflection was that it was very helpful for understanding people's ideas about shame and the way that those actually shaped their experience of shame and being able to resolve shame afterwards. For instance, there was quite a difference between people who, for whom their experience of shame Shame and the shame itself seemed like a kind of weakness um, and a, a situation where maybe they'd been exposed to, to bullying or some kind of shaming attack. And there was a sense that um, they shouldn't have felt shamed by that, that it was um, a, a, a kind of 
inappropriate disrespect or mocking that they'd experienced from someone else. And therefore, um, shame was, in, in, in some sense, shameful. And therefore, people had that kind of meta shame about their experience. Whereas for other people in other contexts, particularly where shame seemed fused with guilt and was about something they felt they'd done that was wrong themselves, there was a sense of shame being a moral imperative, something that, that, that was right, that they ought to feel. And in that situation, it was actually it was quite difficult for them to leave the shame behind for other reasons um, it, 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 it kind of shamelessness would have felt even more shame shameful in that kind of situation so the questionnaire was useful in that people were writing quite succinctly and we could get a sense of their ideas about the experience um, and the meanings that shame had for them that was shaping that experience. But there were a number of challenges and a number of questions that this left for me about using anonymous questionnaires. And I think the first question is who fills in a questionnaire like this? And, you know, I, it, 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 it's, it, uh, that would be a research question in itself I think if we could get people to talk about why they did or didn't fill in um, a um, shame questionnaire there were what, clearly one or two response, responses that were possibly quite jokey that we weeded out but for the rest of the participants this seemed to be engaging with the aims of the research um, and some of them talked quite eloquently some of them much more briefly but I wondered is, did this tell us something about experiences for people who find it cathartic to write, to disclose? Does this tell us about experiences um, for people who are interested in emotion or people who want to be helpful? And I think it would be a mistake to assume that this is kind of a broad cross-section of people who've experienced shame. Another thing that we noticed was that some of the answers were quite short. And I mean, that's always an issue when you use qualitative questionnaires instead of more interactive forms of data collection. And there's no opportunity to explore meaning with the participants. But I think particularly for shame, given that often with shame, there's a turning away from the experience and a feeling of, of um, denial, it was not surprising that some of the answers were really um, quite short. But also, I did wonder about some of the ethical issues in using a questionnaire like this. There was no obligation to complete the questionnaire. And presumably, if people found it difficult, they would have stopped doing it or not submitted the questionnaire. But I did still wonder, given some of the stories that people were recounting, what it felt like to have written about that on your own and be left with that experience on your own. And given what the findings were suggesting about the importance of connection with others, belonging, validation for resolving shame and being able to normalize your experiences um, by hearing about other people's experiences, I did, you know, it did raise questions for me about people being, being potentially left on their own with that experience. But one of the overarching questions, and this is something that, that also has been raised for me about, uh, about doing interviews about shame, is, is what we're asking of participants, the tasks is to report shame whilst also constructing a positive identity as we all tend to want to do day to day as a research participant. And just wondering about what's going on when people are writing. For instance, there were some people who wrote 
about how the experience had changed them, how they've changed since the experience, how they were now older, wiser, more able to contextualize the experience, um, how they'd shifted their perception of how they were positioned because they'd be, be they'd been able to understand the role that somebody else had played and would now see themselves as a victim rather than as somebody that had behaved shamefully. So they were talking, they were writing about how this had shifted, but I did wonder about the extent to which we can read that simply as a transparent account account of what's gone on outside of the context of filling in this questionnaire or to what extent was this about people managing their identity whilst filling in the questionnaire even though it was anonymous um, it, there was still a relationship between that person and the assumed researcher who constructed the questionnaire and what, 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 what were people doing? What, was it partly that they were actually saying to me as the researcher, I might have behaved shamefully then, or there might have been something shameful about me that I became aware of, but I'm not really that person. I've moved on from that. I'm different. Um, and I shouldn't really be held to account for that. I should be seen in a much more positive light. So we do have to be careful, I think, sometimes about seeing these kinds of data collection methods as a transparent window to people's experiences. And sometimes it, 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 we have choices about how we read data. And sometimes we might choose instead to read it as a, as a in a more discursive way, as a way of understanding how people construct identity. And that's an issue as well for um, conducting interviews with people about their experiences of shame. Um, and I want to talk a little bit now about my experiences of interviewing people about their use of mental health services. The aim of this study was to explore the potential for shame in accessing mental health services and how people might um, resist being positioned in shameful ways um, and might manage the shame, potential shame, of being a user of mental health services. There's a paradox in using mental health services that... Um, in that often people are accessing mental health services because of chronic difficulties with shame. People are seeking help to overcome chronic feelings of worthlessness sometimes, social anxiety, and um, some of what gets labeled as depression um, is actually encompassing phenomena that, might other, th th that we might talk about as shame. So people are accessing services for that kind of help. And yet, despite the many anti-stigma campaigns, we all know that some psychiatric diagnoses and the fact that you're uh, using mental health services can be seen to confer quite a stigmatizing identity. And on top of that, when you're accessing mental health services, um, you can feel that it's a situation of exposure. You're being asked to expose um, some very private, very personal information. And in a situation where you may feel that what people are there for is to judge whether you are normal or not. So a strong potential for shame. So um, the research was, was, uh, came about because I think it's important to, to understand how we can help people navigate um, this paradox. So it seemed important to understand how people did and how some people were maybe more resilient to that potential for shame than others and what had been helpful about other pe uh, people's responses such as um, mental health staff. And interviews seem useful because of, all, of, of, of the, some of the constraints I've just mentioned of, 
of using other methods. And also there was something about using um, individual interviews that seemed important in, in terms of giving a voice to, uh, um, to people who don't always have a strong voice about their care, who can be a marginalized group. And doing that in a way um, that allowed me to engage with people's accounts um, more fully and not in a, a, a more public environment, such as say a, a focus group. But of course there are challenges and I want to start um, thinking about um, some of the challenges. So the first thing obviously is how to provide a safe and accepting environment where people can talk about their experiences of shame or dealing with the, um, with the potential for stigma and being shamed. And this was quite a, a, a group of quite vulnerable people potentially people who had struggled with the mental health though for all of them that was something that that to some extent was in the past though many of them were still accessing mental health services and I was aware as well that this was a, a, a different experience than talking to people as a therapist as a therapist you have the opportunity to get to know someone to build trust before you start probing very difficult experiences but in, in most research situations it's a one-off interview and you are in effect strangers so you, you you're breaking that kind of taboo about what what strangers might discuss as well as talking to people who don't necessarily fully know how you will use that information and an additional problem um, or additional challenge, I should say, with this group was how do you talk about the potential for shame in accessing mental health services without seeming to imply that it is shameful to have mental health difficulties or to access services? And it seemed quite important to avoid implying that there was something shameful, partly because some of the interviewees were teenagers. So what, what I did was instead of a direct focus on, on shame, I asked about people's experiences of disclosure, their experiences of concealing their difficulties. We talked about embarrassment. We talked about how other people had responded to their difficulties. We talked about their understanding of mental health problems, what it meant to get a psychiatric diagnosis and how different aspects of the service have made them feel good or bad about themselves. Occasionally, I asked about shame or feeling ashamed, if that felt, felt pertinent, but we didn't use the S word all that much in the um, interviews. But still, there was some quite frank discussion about um, experiences of shame and of the awareness of stigma and how people had dealt with that. But, and people were really quite generous talking about some of their experiences. But despite that, particularly when I look back at some of the transcripts, I was initially a bit surprised to find that I really hadn't opened up some of the discussion as much as I thought I had. And I was surprised that I hadn't, given my own clinical background, that I hadn't explored some of the experiences of shame quite as much as I could have. And Morrison talks about even with therapists, we tend to turn away from someone else's shame because it reminds us of our own shame as well as it being painful. But I think there's something else going on here as well as that. And I think what, what it was partly was a concern about being persecutory and a concern about the ethics of, of pursuing um, experiences that seem to have been quite difficult and quite painful for people. And I think that is a valid um, ethical concern when interviewing people 
um, about shame. So ironically, what was happening there is um, that despite my interest in exploring how people manage shame or the potential for shame outside of the interview, my attempts to manage shame within the interview were actually, I think, to some extent, closing that discussion down. But there were a number of benefits of interviewing. Um, I'm just aware of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just summarize. But I think one of them was that an interview very clearly gives people permission to expose layers of experience. And I think even if people are prepared to talk about quite shaming experiences, they may not always do so if they don't feel that it, it, the, that that will be what's wanted. There's a, the, I think there can be a sense of, uh, of people feeling that they're inappropriately psychologically undressing unless we actually give them a very clear, very clear feedback that we value what they're saying. And this indeed is what we're, what we're here to explore. And I think it's possible to do that through an interview more clearly that you, than you can with more distance, less interactive methods. But it's still a fine line between opening up and facilitating discussion um, and not probing in a way that I think can almost become persecutory. And I think my concern was about causing pain for people um, for my own research ends. And it, I, I found that quite difficult to know where the line is and where the balance is. And I, I would be interested to hear other people's experiences. So just finally and briefly as a contrast, um, more recently I've, I've done some research looking at women's experiences of self-conscious emotions in receiving breastfeeding support. Um, and this study has drawn on the vast amount of qualitative data there already is about experiences of receiving breastfeeding support that, that was never intended to focus on experiences of shame. Um, but in fact, once we looked at it, there was a lot of very rich material there about shame um, that, that, that's already there without asking participants to do something potentially difficult. So I became aware of the potential for shame in relation to breastfeeding through a piece of research I'd done that initially I thought had nothing to do with um, shame. We were, we were looking at women's experiences in the very early stages of breastfeeding and I was quite struck um, quite taken aback by the distress of some women. We were using audio diaries, um, um, and I, I wish there was time to sort of talk a little bit about that as well, but that was quite a productive way of, of giving the control to participants to just narrate in the moment some of their experiences. Women were talking about feeling failures because of challenges, breastfeeding. Women were also talking about embarrassment, about disgust, and the difficulty of breastfeeding in front of other people. And it, and it became apparent that trying to breastfeed in a society that can sometimes see exposing your breasts as embarrassing, um, shameful, um, but yet we're also women are, are aware of breast is best and the encouragement that to be a good mother, you need to breastfeed. It's a situation that's ripe for um, self-conscious emotions. So with a couple of midwifery colleagues, we decided to look at what at, at, at the experience of receiving breastfeeding support and to look at what that told us maybe about the role that self-conscious emotion can play in that environment when you also have the gaze of healthcare professionals who you think maybe think you ought to be breastfeeding. So what we did was we looked at previous findings and analyses of 34 papers that are collected data on women's experiences of, of using breastfeeding support. We, because of um, shame can, can be kind of fleeting and on the periphery of awareness and, and kind of all the taboos around shame, 
um, we developed a coding template that had a fairly um, broad definition of self-conscious emotion. So we weren't just looking at explicit references to self-conscious emotions. We were also looking at positive and negative self-appraisals. Um, data around feeling exposed, concerns about wrongdoing, about being judged by other people, and women talking uh, in ways that seem to be about constructing a positive identity that resisted the idea um, that there was anything shameful about their breastfeeding experiences. So thinking about the value of this approach, I think it, 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 this does show that by, by using this, this data that was already out there, by using studies that are, had already been conducted, it suggested that self-conscious emotions were really under-recognized in breastfeeding support. Some of the studies, we almost felt like they were leaking out of the research papers, but yet the original studies hadn't been aiming to focus on emotion, so that wasn't particularly a focus of the analysis. And there was some material relevant to self-conscious emotions in every single one of those papers, even though, interestingly, not one of the papers explicitly mentioned shame, even though women talked about failure, feeling inadequate um, etc. And we developed a theme of validation versus invalidation to try and capture um, features of healthcare environments that, that, respo that responded differently to, to the potential um, for shame in this situation. But what was particularly useful, I think, was um, that our use of kind of an emotions lens showed that there was an awful lot going on in some of these interactions that was about much more than just receiving breastfeeding support. Women really seemed to be in a situation where identity was precarious and they were um, av avoiding, seem to be avoiding negative self-conscious emotions by talking about how they concealed non-compliance with the advice, being selective in the support that they accessed, trying to avoid feeling a nuisance to staff, um, and a number of other ways that, 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 that just demonstrated how it was almost like kind of swans on the water appeared serene above with, with women paddling furiously underneath. And a lot of what was going on seemed to be about managing identity. So this kind of demonstrates a way of accessing personal um, reports of experiences that give some insight into potential for shame in health contexts in a much what I'd see as a lower risk way. But it, it, this kind of arm's length research obviously means that you don't have the opportunity to test out your interpretations with the original participants. And it's important not to assume that because there is shame-like phenomena, that there's necessary, that's necessarily accompanied by some sort of um, noticeable affect. So just quickly, um, as that and, and some of the other presentations um, earlier demonstrate that people will recount experiences of shame, though those accounts will, I think, be often shaped by presentational concerns and the research situation. But also, uh, particularly um, the, uh, the last study shows that researchers don't always need to sh ask about shame directly. And I think research is, is often still valuable when it explores shame-related phenomena because that enables us to look at how people avoid shame and enables us to look at contexts where shame is maybe fleeting and there's the potential for shame, even if there's not necessarily strong affect. But I also think, particularly from the, the, the last study, that 
the, as well as exploring shame, I think what we ought to be doing as well, and I, I know some of you have, is trying to understand more about de-shaming healthcare contexts and trying to understand what people find respecting and validating and empowering as well as exploring um, what people find to be shameful. Okay. Um, we're going to take some questions. Um, we'll take maybe one from Zoom, but we'll start with people in the room. So, person at the top there was first. Uh, thanks so much. So, I, I want to ask a question that might be a little bit tangential, tangential to your main focus. But there was at one point in your talk where you were saying that the, the shame avoidance and the unwillingness to kind of manifest shame and talk about shame might somehow be related to uh, individualistic Western societies where we are supposed to be self reliant. And I mean, I was a little bit surprised by that because it could be taken to entail that in non-Western societies that supposedly, I'm not sure I really buy that argument, but that supposedly are more collectivistic, people are much more willing to feel shame and manifest shame and talk about shame. And I don't really find that particularly convincing. So I don't know if you, do you have any kind of cross psychological or cross cultural perspectives on on this yeah it's a to be it's a little while since i've read um some of the research but uh, yeah i think that and, and other people might uh, remember i think there is some evidence that 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 shame is less shameful in collectivist cultures um um and uh, yeah sorry i really can't remember um but, but I know Thomas Sheff is one of the people that has written about that. Um, and, and there is some er empirical evidence that um, in non-Western in, in, in non cultures, there's, there's more of a sort of openness about shame. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I, I'm uh, I'm struck by um, uh, something that was uh, also theme in the first uh, talk that we heard today, namely the idea that uh, shame is uh, somehow uh, intimately connected, uh, if not defined as um, with the notion of failure. I mean, failure of like. Um, as a person, or uh, as you expressed it, um, um, shame as the pain of being someone uh, we don't wish to be. And, and, and my question would be, uh, I mean, why not shame as the pain of being who you are? Uh, I, mean, I mean, why, why do, um, uh, I mean, isn't it precise expressive of, of uh, or might it not be expressive of uh, who you are that you actually uh, feel shame under uh, certain circumstances and you yourself said that uh, there are cases where it is even more shameful uh, if you don't uh, uh, feel uh, shame so it's it's uh, sometimes actually the the like the uh, healthy uh, reaction to the situation you should feel shame and it's appropriate and adequate yeah um so i i, I just wonder um why you think, or, or I mean, isn't it better to to get rid of this uh, sense of, of of this idea of uh, uh, failure? I mean, that that uh, um, that uh, feeling shameful, like in some way, uh, refers or presupposes um, uh, a, a failure in in uh, what uh, in, in uh, uh, who uh, one uh, uh, wants to be. Um, so, and. I think sometimes shame can feel like something 
we should feel is that why that, that, that shame in itself is not some kind of failure and I think one of the findings from from one of the studies that was that the sense of shame being a moral imperative is very much there I think particularly when when people feel that they have done something wrong and that they they should feel shame but in other contexts shame I think can feel like a failure a failure to have kind of sort of giving in to a shaming attack if you've been humiliated by somebody or disrespected and you feel it's unjust um I mean, a sort of throw, it would almost seem like a throwaway comment from one of the research participants that got me thinking. She was somebody who'd been part of a campaigning group around mental health stigma. And she said, yes, I did feel shame, much to my shame. I felt shame in that context because she felt I'm an anti-stigma campaigner. I shouldn't let this stuff get to me. Um, and, and so I think that it's like, an additional layer, the potential kind of meta shame. Is, is that what? Sorry, is that answering your question? Uh, yes, but but it, but it, it it suggests to me that if it depends on on the context and, and on the situation, uh, uh, whether a failure is in, is is involved, if we suppose, then then it shouldn't be built into the definition of of uh, of shame. I mean, it shouldn't be used like as as that would what what explains what uh, what uh, shame is. Yeah. But, but precisely leave it open to this possibility. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if failure necessarily is part of the well, yeah. definition of, of shame. Yeah, yeah. Last question then, and then we'll just Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think I was mentioned then, so I, I don't think failure is part of the definition of shame. I think there's a mismatch, you know, there's a mismatch between a projected self or a perceived self you know, or a, a self, an expected self and the self you experience at a particular time, whether this, whether that self is, you know, the authentic self or not is, is not part of a definition of shame. Shame is about the mismatch um, between those two things. Um, so on to my question, um, I, I really like that a lot. Um, I'm, I'm known in my department for being very anti-interviews. So to see somebody of actually going through the process and working it out in the process, you know, that actually this gives us better data was, was, was really great to see. So um, I, like, I like that a lot. So I was wondering, and I, I really liked the looking at existing data and then subjecting that to analysis. So I was wondering if you were, if you were to design a study now, um, I mean, I guess you could just keep looking at existing data and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And in fact, as you showed it, it bears fruit. But if you were to set about doing a study, um, I'd be interested to know how you would, how you would recommend somebody gather data yeah, I mean, it would depend, wouldn't it, exactly the context and what you were trying to explore. I think if I were going to do interviews again, particularly having read some of your... Actually, I meant not, not inter you're not allowed to do interviews. <laughs> right. I, I, I think ethnographic approaches have quite a bit to commend them because of the way that you can incorporate some interviewing but maybe on a repeat basis so that um, you develop trust get to know people but also I think I've become quite interested in understanding how healthcare organizations contexts produce a, a shaming blame oriented environment and I think actually spend methods that allow you to really immerse yourself in a context and understand that broader context I, I think would be what I, I mean it depends on the study would be what I might be interested in in using I mean for instance with breastfeeding support and the potential for shame some of the stories women 
told of, of, of particularly on labour wards, staff having made them just feel awful. Um, but then when you hear about midwives, just anecdotally, you hear about the perspective of midwives on those wards and you become aware of how the whole thing's set up so there isn't the opportunity to spend time with people. Um, and I think that kind of research gives you a, a lens on experiences of shame, which I think is broader. Mm -hmm. I, sorry, can I just come back with one thing? Um, yeah. So, I, um, so I, I think the thing you said right at the end is 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 one tool as well, isn't it? Which I, I thought was really interesting. The the idea that we don't look don't look for shame, look for the you know and. And one of the things I mentioned this morning was that Goff, Irving Goffman had wanted to include Harold Garfinkel's study of the transgender woman Agnes in, in stigma. And of course, that's an example not of somebody experiencing stigma, but of somebody, you know, engaged in very sophisticated uh, practices to avoid stigma, to pass as a woman, uh, to avoid stigmatization. And, you know, so in some senses that tells you more, because as you say, the problem we all face when we try to research shame in this sense is the very uh, constituency we want to learn most from are the hardest to reach and the hardest to get to participate in our studies and, and get good data from. So perhaps we learn more by, by studying the strategies people use for avoiding shame and stigma. Yeah. 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 So I say thank you to John for doing what they're doing, doing research and sharing incredibly thought provoking and topic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>